Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs here, and today I want to talk about iron and ferritin and your thyroid. Uh, so in terms of importance, and I would say in terms of the importance of certain nutrients as it relates to the thyroid function, iron is probably up there in terms of one of the most important. Um, I would put it right up there with vitamin B12, and so I'll do, I'll do a video on vitamin B12 and, and how to evaluate that, but for now let's kind of focus on iron. So when we talk about iron, everybody probably knows at least a little bit about iron, uh, especially if you're a woman. Why? Because um, iron is required for normal red blood cell function, and anything that would cause you to lose iron or to or anything that would cause you to bleed, such as a woman's menstrual cycle, may cause iron deficiency in a female, right? So women are kind of especially attuned or tuned to to uh, be aware of this condition, and you may know it as anemia. Now, there's there that's one thing, and then there's another thing. So you kind of have to distinguish between the difference of um, iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia, which are two separate things. And that's very important as it relates to thyroid function, and we'll talk about that. So why do we care so much about iron, and why do we care so much about ferritin, and how does it all kind of circle together with your thyroid? So, so probably the number one most important thing is that normal iron levels are required for normal thyroid function. Okay, and so basically what this means, this gets a little complex and a little bit nuanced, but um, what I'll say right now is there's certain enzymes inside of your thyroid gland that require adequate amounts of iron to basically create, to basically create um, thyroid hormone. And then in addition, iron is required for the activation um, of, of uh, thyroid hormone in your cells. So you kind of have a double whammy there of where thyroid, uh, or I'm sorry, of where iron is important for hypothyroid patients. So that's one, one, one important aspect is that it's required for normal function of thyroid hormone and normal production of thyroid hormone. And then um, on the other hand, you have this, this um, synergy between iron and thyroid hormone where your body, in order to absorb iron, the iron that you consume, you must have adequate levels of thyroid hormone. So you, you can get in this sort of vicious cycle whereby your body may be low in thyroid hormone, right, which causes decreased iron absorption, which causes decreased iron function, which causes further decreased iron absorption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in a, in a vicious cycle. So that's why it's actually really, really important. Now, what we need to talk about here, I'm going to talk about some of the symptoms and things like that. Um, actually, let's do that now. So we'll talk about how how to know if you think you might have low ferritin and low iron. And so what I will tell you is this just right off the bat. We'll talk about the labs and everything in just a moment here. But um, so I keep using the terms ferritin and, I, and using um, the term iron. And so I kind of want to describe to you what, what it means and and because I'm sure you've heard this, you know, around. So first of all, ferritin is a marker. It's a serum marker. So you can check it in the blood, a marker or it's an estimate of how much um, iron store is in your body. Okay, so it's kind of like it's kind of like if you had, um, you know, in your kitchen you have food out on the counters and everything, and you can see that food, and you're like, okay, you know, great, there's this X amount of food, and that would be the equivalent of your your serum iron, the amount of iron that's kind of like readily available and ready for eat, ready for you to eat, versus ferritin, which would be like you opening up your refrigerator and looking at all the food inside your refrigerator and be like, okay, well, I have a, you know, even though I have um, a lot of food out on the counter, I still have a lot in, uh, for backup as well. So ferritin is that amount that's there for backup. And that's why it's, it's actually really important. And it does have some specific functions, but think of it in this way. So when you check iron levels in the blood, you're looking at what is your body capable of using right now. And ferritin is what does your body have in reserve if something happens. So that's why ferritin is really, really actually more important. Now, th that gets a little more nuanced. We'll talk about that in a minute. But so if you're a thyroid patient, what's important for you is, do you have adequate ferritin levels? Okay, and it's first of all, it's really easy to check. It's really easy to just check your um, your serum ferritin level and your serum iron, the iron levels and look at the optimal ranges, which we will talk about, and determine, do you have enough, right? So it's actually quite simple. Um, but even even before you do that, you might ask yourself, well, what kind of symptoms might, have I, might I expect if I have low ferritin or if I have low iron? So let's talk about those really quick. So first of all, and this was where things can get a little bit tricky, but one of the symptoms of low ferritin is hypothyroid-like symptoms, okay, right? And it makes sense, right? Because if I just told you that iron is required for optimal thyroid function um, and thyroid production, then if you have low amounts, then the symptoms that you might experience would be um, reminiscent of hypothyroidism, right? And so that can get confusing because what a situation that might occur is something like this. I say, okay, well, you know, let's say, 
you know, you, you're here and you have iron deficiency and I'm giving you thyroid hormone because I know that you're hypothyroid and you're like, hey, uh, you know, I, my symptoms are still here. I'm still losing my hair. I'm still fatigued. I'm still short of breath. You know, you gave me thyroid hormone and told me those would go away, but they're still here. And your doctor's like, well, your thyroid labs are fine. I don't understand. Well, that could be because even though your thyroid is adequate, your iron is not, okay? So that's why these things are, that's why it's very important to have both checked and just giving you thyroid hormone does not replace the ferritin that was lost. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, and this is actually, could it be up there for number one in terms of what's actually really important to generally feed, well, actually I'd say men and women, but definitely women as well, and that is increased hair loss or lack of hair growth. Iron is probably the number one most important nutrient for hair growth, okay? And that means, and this is actually huge because most women, you know, well, there's a fair amount of women who have issues with hair loss or their hair is thinning or it's not growing as fast as it was. And one of the main reasons for that is iron deficiency. Not iron deficiency anemia, but iron deficiency. And I'll talk to you about some studies that kind of prove this. So that's that's a very, very, very important thing is that if you're having increased hair loss and you're taking thyroid hormone, it's not going away, you need to look at your iron. Number one, that's number one in terms of priority. Okay. And there are studies that show you cannot grow your hair adequately unless you have a ferritin. Well, the, the, the levels in the studies kind of vary, but minimum of 30 and probably realistically up to 70 of a ferritin level, right? That's a serum ferritin level. Okay, so another really important one. Um, number three in terms of symptoms would be low energy or chronic fatigue. That's These are very common. Um, and again, it goes along with the hypothyroidism. It also goes along with the fact that if you actually do have anemia, you have fewer circulating red blood cells, which means you have a decreased capacity to deliver oxygen to your tissues, and therefore, you're going to have lower energy production and low energy, right? That's just kind of how it goes. Um, so another one would be the inability to tolerate exercise or um, lots of shortness of breath when you do exercise. So that one's pretty obvious. It's kind of like, well, I, you know, let's say you used to be a marathon runner and you walk up a flight of stairs and you're, you know, severely winded, right? That's just not normal. That's, that could be, that could be part of the issue. Uh, the next one would be decreased immune function. Iron's important for the, for normal, uh, for normal immune function. And so any reduction in that or reduction in ferritin, reduction in iron may lead to symptoms such as catching every cold that you come into contact with, things like that. You know, just being sick for longer than normal people. Like let's say everyone in your family gets, uh, a little cold and they get over it within three to five days and you on the other hand stick with it for seven to ten days Some, something like that right to just imply that the immune system is not what it used to be um, and then finally um, GI related issues can, can uh, be involved there so gas bloating nutrient deficiency stomach acid etc um, so let's talk about a couple of studies here and talk about um, why this may be missed more co or why this yeah why this may be missed by physicians and why it's going to be up to you to understand what I'm talking about here. So number one is that there's an interesting study that showed that iron supplementation given to um, non-anemic, meaning normal red blood cell menstruating women, showed it was like okay, let me let me put it this way. They took a they took a group of of women who were menstruating, right, um, who had subjective low energy levels and they complained of fatigue. And they looked at their labs and they said, well. You know, you're not anemic, but your iron's kind of low. So let's do an experiment. Let's give you iron to see if that helps you any. And guess what? It did. So we took people who are not anemic, but had low iron or suboptimal iron levels, gave them iron, and lo and behold, they got better, right? Or they fit, well, they didn't get completely better, but they did have an improvement, a subjective improvement in energy levels and a reduction in fatigue. Now, this is really important because your doctor has a distinction, as I mentioned previously, between iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. Now, one of these is taken very seriously, and that's anemia, right? Because of the aforementioned reasons that I mentioned. However, iron deficiency by itself is not taken quite as seriously. It's kind of like if you had low iron, but normal blood cells, they, normal red blood cells, your doctor might say, yeah, I'll just eat a little bit of extra meat and you'll be good. Well, that's not necessarily, th you need to do some more digging. You need to find out, A, why does this person have low iron, and B, what, replace it in the meantime, okay? So a lot of this tends to be kind of shooed away by most physicians, kind of like, well, it's not a big deal. If, you, if it was really a big deal, you'd be anemic. But that's not true. We're talking about optimal levels here. We're talking about quality of life here, and this is what's important. So remember, there's a difference between being anemic and having low iron and just having low iron in general, and one's going to be more likely to be missed. Um, so the other thing is, uh, what I would say is you have to understand you have to understand that, that there is a difference between those two things and you can't kind of be blown off if you're not anemic. So just realize that there, there's a difference and we'll talk about those iron levels there. Um, so we kind of mentioned uh, what to look out for in terms of symptoms and why this is a big deal. And I've included relevant studies here that you can kind of take a look with. Um, one other thing that's worth pointing out here that I, that I get a lot is women will 
notice when they take a prenatal vitamin that their hair suddenly grows. And they're like, oh my gosh, like this prenatal vitamin is amazing. It makes my hair grow. There's something, there must be something, some sort of miracle supplement in it. There isn't. There's just iron in it because most women are iron deficient, I've found anyway, especially hypothyroid patients because of the aforementioned reasons. So how do you supplement with it and why would you? Um, so first of all, we need to talk about how to tell if you need it. Iron is one of those things where you really don't want to take it unless you have low levels. It's, it's what I would call a Goldilocks nutrient, right? Too little is a big deal. Um, too much is also a big deal. It's actually an equally big deal because then, you know, you run into iron overload and toxicity syndromes. Um, so you really need this Goldilocks right in the middle type of thing. So how do you know if you're there? You need to look at this optimal range. You need to look at optimal ranges. So for ferritin, I recommend that you have levels between 40 to 50. Okay. So those are serum levels and 40 to 50 is kind of, I really, don't want you to go too much higher than that. Uh, the reason is because uh, ferritin can also be, and again, we're getting a little nuanced here, but but ferritin can be, uh, it is a, an acute phase reactant. So in, in high inflammatory states, ferritin becomes less useful in terms of its ability to to help you understand what your iron store is uh, at higher levels. But at low levels, it's very sensitive for that. So you got to kind of consider that. So ferritin optimal is probably 40 to 50. If you're having issues with hair loss, you might want to consider getting that up to 70, depending on how important that is. But I wouldn't generally recommend that, at least without you know discussing that with your physician. So serum iron, the actual serum iron level itself, what's available directly for use in your blood, that should be somewhere in the middle of the reference range. Um, and uh, let's see, do I have a... Yeah, I do. So if you look here... Um, iron on this particular patient is 53 and the reference range is 40 to 190. So you can see this person, you know, 40 to 190, there's 150 points, you know, in between, in between this reference range. And she, this person's at the very bottom of the low of the reference range, right? There, she's technically normal, but she's low. Okay. And you can see that as evidenced by her percent saturation, which is 13 on the reference range of 15 to 15 to 50. And this is flagging as low. So you have to, you have to kind of, and this is why your doctor may look at it and be like, ah, well, your iron's okay. Uh, eat a little bit of meat and you'll be okay. Meanwhile, you have hair loss, you have fatigue, you have all these symptoms, right? So that's why this is important. Your TIBC should be, again, middle of the reference range, and your percent saturation should be probably somewhere between 35 and 38%. So this this patient's somewhere sitting around 13, which is significantly lower than this, and so therefore we got some issues. So again, that's kind of how you would want to look at it, but again, it's a Goldilocks thing. So you want to make sure you're not getting too much, but you are getting enough. So how do you replace it? Um, a lot of you probably in the past have taken uh, oral iron medication and it's caused constipation or GI issues or all these other things. And it's been a bit of like, I should say iron tablets or iron pills. Now that is a consideration. You do not want to give somebody who already has existing GI related issues like low stomach acid or hypothyroidism or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth or small intestinal fungal overgrowth. You really don't want to give these patients anything that's going to make their GI system worse. So you have to take that in consideration. Um, because of this, I, I feel that most hypothyroid patients do better on liquid iron. Okay. And so liquid iron, I, I give you a recommended product here, but I, I do suggest that if you have hypothyroidism specifically that you consider using liquid iron oral over oral, I'm sorry, oral, over, wow, can't get that out, over oral capsules or tablets. Um, and the other, but the other thing is though, that's not going to work for every single one of you. So you have to at least put in the back of your head um, that you might need some special, some, some capsules because not everyone absorbs it. Not everyone does the best on, on any one supplement, right? You need to do some experimentation. So if that's the case, I've also included my recommended brand of iron, which is a highly absorbable. It comes with, comes with cofactors that increase absorb, absorption like vitamin C, etc. So you want to preferentially start with a liquid iron and then move to the capsule, um, uh, form, uh, depending on how you do and, and, and all that. Now, the important thing here too, is to remember, monitor your levels while you're supplementing. You do not want to accidentally take too much. So this generally should not be done on your own. You want to at least have some idea what you're doing, work with your doctor, you know, so you guys can come to, uh, so you can find that sweet spot that I'm talking about. But the important thing here is just to be aware, be aware that low iron causes a lot of issues in hypothyroid patients and hypothyroid patients are at increased risk for developing low iron. And number two, there's a big difference between being iron deficient and having iron deficiency anemia, right? And most attention will be put on those who are anemic, not who are the, not those who are just iron deficient. So anyway, that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. So hypothyroidism, um, low ferritin, um, and replacing your iron stores. So if you have any questions about this, um, leave them in the comments below and I'll try and get to them as soon as I can. Um, but otherwise, I hope you guys found this was helpful.